Heavenly Father, we're surely grateful and thankful that we can lean on those everlasting arms. Thank you, Father, for having called us out of darkness into the marvelous light of the gospel of redemption and salvation. Thank you for your wonderful deliverance. And Heavenly Father, I'm truly grateful for the privilege of being back home here at International with your people. Thank you for the love of God that has been shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. And I thank you for giving us a wonderful night for all of our children, our young people, and our adults, and just blessing our people abundantly who have dialed in for this Sunday night. In the name of Jesus Christ, I thank you. Amen. You may be seated, please. And it's springtime in Ohio. I don't know what it is all over the country, but it's a good time to be here. And I thought one of my homespun poems is sort of appropriate. A little seed lay in the ground and soon began to sprout. Now which of all the flowers around it mused, shall I come up? The lily's face is fair but proud and just a trifle cold. The rose, I think, is rather loud, and then its fashion is old. The violet is pretty well, but not the flower I'd choose, nor yet the Canterbury bell. I never cared for blue. And so it criticized each flower, that supercilious seed, until it woke one summer morn and found itself a weed. In behalf of the Board of Trustees of the Way International, I would like to make a presentation to him at this time, and this is elegant, it's absolutely beautiful, that Christopher Watkins prepared and for our, our as a gift from the Board of Trustees to Ray this evening. It is, that's what he quoted to you a while ago, say it again. Klaffer het leven in overlord. Klaffer het leven in overvloed. Overlord. Overvloed. Good. That's good. <laughs> this expression of recognition and commemoration of the completion of another power for abundant living class in a language of our brother and sister's across the world, it says here, this expression of recognition and splendid achievement is extended to Rhino Jan Brandt in commemoration of the completion of the Power for Abundant Living class in the Dutch language and other milestones in the achievement of holding forth the Word of God to the world. Upon returning to his homeland, he can now make available to a believing people this magnificent class in their own tongue, that they too may begin to live for God and His Word, a more than abundant life. May the 2nd, 1982, and it's signed by Gary Curtis and by myself. And at the bottom of it is that great scripture, John 10, 10b. Quoted to him in Dutch, will you? Ik ben gekomen op dat zij het leven hebben en overvloed hebben. Came that we might have life and have it how? More about it. And sir, in behalf of the Board of Trustees, I'm truly proud to present it to you, sir. Certainly thank God for the ability latent within our people and that they utilize that and bring it forth and make it possible for other people to have the class. I know the amount of work it is to do it in English. Then for these men to do it in their languages must also be comparable at least to the amount of work it takes in English. So I'm grateful. And I too am believing that it's going to be possible for us to have it in 50, in 50 different languages. I think you notice tonight up there it says, just 49 more days until living victoriously. I trust some of us are already living victoriously and don't have to <laughs> wait 49 days. But they're talking about a class. And it's almost unbelievable to me that 
We've only got 49 days left, but I imagine when that time comes, we'll be ready to go. Because everybody's believing, everybody's working, everybody's praying, and it seems to me like that should be one of the great times in the history of the world coming up. And I'm blessed for the privilege to be a part of that wonderful period of time. Take your Bible and open to Psalm 121, please. Lib and Eston Smith, I understand we got a new married couple in here tonight. They just handed me this note. Our wonderful Peggy Little of the Eighth Corps got married yesterday at Lib and Eston Smith's place, and she married James Morell, and they're living in Oklahoma City. I'd like for this newly married couple, James and Peggy Morell, to stand, please. Bless your heart. There you are. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's wonderful to spend your honeymoon here tonight with us. I love that. <laughs> well, I think that's tremendous. It blesses my heart. I'm thankful to be informed of these things. That's Lib's wonderful daughter. And real thankful. I thought tonight I'd share something with you that has been burning in my heart as I traveled around to all these so far seven weekends in our 40th anniversary year. Because people consistently, wherever I go, keep bringing up, well, the way ministry is a biblical research ministry and just really, what does that all mean? Well, it's not nearly as intellectual as it sounds. See? Uh, we are just some people who love God and love his word, and we love to work it. But the way ministry, people, is a fellowship. A fellowship. You can't have a fellowship unless you agree on something. If you're mad at me and I'm mad at you, we're not going to have much what? Fellowship. So the way ministry is a fellowship of the followers of the Lord Jesus Christ or the manifestation of the more than abundant life. And the way believers are men and women filled with and manifest power from on high, meaning that they're filled with the Holy Spirit and they're men and women who freely avail themselves of fellowship me uh, meetings for their spiritual nurture and growth. And the way fellowship is cemented together by the love of God. With each individual believer being transformed by the renewing of his or her mind according to the Word of God. The way fellowship is not a membership list. It's not a baptismal list. It is what I have just defined it to be. And the way ministry accepts and believes the Scriptures, the Bible, to be the true revelation from God and about God. And it is our only rule of faith and practice. It is not our primary rule of faith and practice. It is our only rule of faith and practice. So the way ministry is a biblical research, a biblical teaching, and a biblical fellowship ministry. And this is for all people. Well, then what is research? Research, biblical research, is not primarily to learn something new, but it is to re-research, to reinvestigate, 
to rediscover anew the Scriptures for ourselves in order to know what God has revealed to us and for our learning. All the benefits of our biblical research work, all the benefits are designed for those who desire to hear, and that is teaching. And when believers meet, that is fellowship. So that is the way biblical research, teaching, and fellowship ministry. Now all believing equals receiving. Nobody ever receives anything without believing. Believing equals receiving. And what you are doing today will determine your tomorrows. Basically, the heart cry of every man, I should say the heart cry of every young individual, basically is, for help. Perhaps when you reach the adult stage that some of us have arrived at, you get to that place that your heart's no longer crying for help because you have come to the conclusion that there's no help any place anyway, anyhow. But dealing with a lot of young people, through all of these years of my life in the ministry, the young people, children, young people, and young adults basically are always crying for help. Their heart, they may not say this on the outside, they may cover, but deep within their heart, they're really crying for help. They're looking for help. Man's help never comes from any other basic source than God. The government really cannot help you, nor can all the social programs or anything else. Man's basic cry for help is God. In Psalm 121, this first verse is inaccurate in King James, but we'll correct it according to the text and get it right on. King James says, I will lift up mine eyes unto what? The hills, from whence cometh my help. All the pagan temples all over the world basically are built on hills. They always put their temples at the top of the hill to be sure that everybody in the valley and in town could see them up there. Those of us who've traveled in other countries besides these, our United States, have seen this also in other countries, that their temples, their places of worship are always built on hills. That's where they worship their God. King James says, I lift up mine eyes unto the hills. No, no, no. The original text reads, shall I, it's a question, shall I lift up mine eyes unto the hills? What's on the hills? The temples to what? The pagan gods. Shall I lift up mine eyes unto the hills? From whence cometh my help? The question. My help does not come from the pagan temples on the hills. My help, verse 2, cometh from what? The Lord who made what? Heaven and earth. That's the accuracy of verse 1 of a hundred and Psalm 121. 
The heart's cry of the common man is for help. The help doesn't come from pagan gods, from temples built in upon hills. My help cometh from the Lord, who made what? Heaven and earth. And he is a God who does not dwell in temples made with human hands. God is a spirit. You see, people, the counterfeit is so much like the genuine. You have to know the accuracy of God's word if you're ever going to separate truth from error. Without knowing the accuracy of God's word, you will never be able to separate truth and error. That's why one of the first great things in the life of an individual who is seeking help is that that individual has to get quiet. In Psalm 46.10, the Word of God declares, Be still and know that I am what? God. Be still and what? Know. Be still and know. K-N-O-W. Be still and know it. The only way you'll ever get to really know God is to get quiet. If you have to isolate yourself someplace, do it. Whatever you need to do with your individual life, you've got to bring it to pass so that you can know that you get past the stage of questioning and doubting all the time. That you may know, that you may know, be still and what? Know that I am what? God. Right. Which I call learning to practice the presence of God. You just get quiet. The greatest cargoes of life come in over what? Quiet sea. You just get still, quiet within. Be still, and then you can get to know the true God. You see, people, there's so much to do in life for us, but there's so little time for us to do it. We have to be absolutely sure that Jesus Christ is the way, John 14, 6. He is the way, he is the truth, he is what? Jesus Christ is not a way among all the other ways of religion. He is not a way among all the ways of those temples built on hills, pagan temples built on hills. We in the way ministry believe that there is only one way to truth, and that is the way of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the way. He is what? The way. He is not a way among a lot of other ways. Buddha may have been wonderful, Muhammad, I don't know about that, but I know there is only one way, and that's the way of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the way, the truth, and the life. In Acts chapter 4, listen to this wonderful record. Acts chapter 4. I mean John 4, it's wrong. Acts 4, <laughs> chapter 4, verse 12. Well, first verse 11. This is the stone which was set at naught of whom? You builders. Who is become or which has become? Who has become the head of the corner? The cornerstone. Verse 12. Neither is there salvation in any what? Right. There is no salvation. And the word salvation here is the word meaning wholeness. W-H-O-L-E, N-E-S-S. There is no other way for wholeness. For there is no other name, none other name under heaven given among men whereby we, what, must be saved. 
made whole. There is no other way. <laughs> People then can say, well, you're prejudiced, you're everything else. They just have to say what they want to say. We just believe God's Word. If they think there's another way, they have tried it. We do not believe that in the way ministry. We believe that the Word of God is the will of God. It's our primary. Nope. It's our what? Only rule for faith and practice. There may be a lot of other wonderful people in the world. Maybe a lot of other fine religions. I don't know. But I know that there is only one way whereby you can have eternal life. And that is the Lord Jesus Christ. For he is the way, the truth, and the life. And he's the only name under heaven given among men whereby we must be what? Saved. In the Gospel of John, in 4.24, you basically all know this. It says God is what? Spirit. God is spirit. The indefinite article A you ought to scratch. God is not a spirit among all the other spirits. There are a lot of other spirits, but God is the spirit. He, God is spirit. God is spirit. And God is called in the Bible the word, word. God is the word. God is the word, and the word for word in the Greek is the word logos, L-O-G-O-S. You see, God is what? Spirit. But God is also the word. Now, how is God, who is spirit, going to communicate to man on the census level? He has to do it by way of words, W-O-R-D-S. You can't see spirit, you can't hear it, smell it, taste it, or touch it. So if God is to communicate to us, it has to be in words. That's why the word logos basically means communication. God to communicate to man had to put it in words. The prophets of old spake as they were what? Moved by the Holy by God. But it was words. God is spirit. The only way you can know God is through that word. He has to communicate that way. That's why in John 1 18, Jesus Christ is the living word. He is the word, the logos. He is God living in reality to the extent making known of God. It's the living reality of God's only begotten Son who always did His will. That's how it was communicated. How the Bible is the word written. And it's the Bible that interprets the will of God to us and for us. Those two prepositions are very important. The Bible interprets it for us. That's why the preached word or the taught word people must accurately make known the written word. Whenever a man teaches or whenever a man preaches, he has to make known the written word. For it's the written word that makes known Christ, and it's Christ who made known God. Whenever anyone teaches or preaches anything else but the written word that is not preaching or teaching, that is a counterfeit. Now, the first major requirement 
in any biblical research for any individual is that you must be willing and you must be prepared to unlearn even all that you've ever learned from your youth. For all must be tested and proven by the written word. That's the first major requirement. Now the first major responsibility that is given to us is that the word of truth must be rightly divided. 2 Timothy 2.15 Study to do what? Show thyself approved unto whom? As a workman. A workman of the word. A workman who needeth not to be ashamed of his workmanship. We're to study to show ourselves approved to, unto God as workmen of the word who need not be ashamed of their workmanship by doing one thing, what? Rightly dividing the word of truth. The scriptures are the word of what? But we have the truth of the word in the proportion and to the extent that I rightly divide it. Where I wrongly divide it, we will not have the truth of the what? But will the Scriptures still be the word of truth? Definitely. Understand? The Scriptures will be the word of truth if nobody believed it. It'd still be the word of truth. This is why it's so important that we research, re-research, that we reevaluate, rediscover for ourselves, working the word, rightly dividing it. Really something. <laughs> How many times we failed through the years to rightly divide the word? How many times Christendom today fails to rightly divide the word? And so we are in all types of confusion and dismay. And it's all because we are not handling the Word of God rightly, rightly dividing it. Sometimes even they handle it deceitfully, deliberately to back up their preconceived ideas. That's why that first major requirement is you have to be willing and ready to unlearn anything you've ever heard or learned before because it has to be checked by the Word. And the first major responsibility of anyone preaching or teaching the Word is to endeavor to rightly divide it. Not endeavor, but to rightly divide it. But we can only rightly divide it to the extent that we understand the Word. That's why in Psalm 119, 162, the psalmist declared, I rejoice at thy what? Word. Rejoice in thy word as one who findeth great spoil, great treasure. Rejoice at the word as one who, spo who finds great treasure. In order to rejoice at the word, you first have to have joy. You cannot rejoy until you first have joy. Remember the twins, Pete and Repeat? <laughs> You cannot rejoice at the word until you first have the what of it, the joy of it. The psalmist said, I rejoice at thy word as one who has found great spoil, great treasure. Do you joy and rejoice at the word as a great treasure? In Jeremiah, 1516, Jeremiah says, Thy word was, words were found, and I did what? Eat them. That doesn't mean 
he chewed on the scroll for breakfast or for a snack after Sunday evening five o'clock fellowship. Thy words were found, and I did eat them. And the word, the word, the word, thy word was unto me the joy and what? Rejoicing of mine heart. You can't have joy and rejoicing of the heart until the word is first found. Thy words were found. That's the first thing you need is the word. You can't ever joy or rejoice until you first have the word. And in order to joy and rejoice, you have to assimilate that word. Eat it. You have to believe it. You have to receive it. You have to eat it, assimilate it, digest it before it becomes efficacious in your day-by-day living. And thy word was the joy, was the joy and the rejoicing of my heart. Is the word the joy and rejoicing of your heart? Or do you still get much more joy and rejoicing watching the boob tube? Reading the daily newspaper or doing something else? For those of us called of God to move the greatness of the word in this day and time, The word has to be for us the joy and rejoicing of our heart. The close of the Healing Arts Advance, Dr. Weingarner came in the back office with me and we sat and visited a little. And we talked about staying at the top of your profession. The reason this came up because he and I like to have two, three days together, isolate ourselves, do be together. I'd like to spend two, three days with about 10,000 people that I know across the nation or nations, but I just don't have that amount of time because if I'm going to really teach the Word, you have to, other things have to be bypassed. You know, if I if I just love to ride motorcycle, you all know that. So if every day I spend two, three, four hours riding motorcycle, you would lose, I would lose the greatness of my ability to handle the Word because I wouldn't be in it. A great concert pianist practices daily. If we're going to be men and women of God, we've got to stay put on the Word. Sure, there are times maybe I can ride motorcycle a little, but it's all secondary. The Word is the joy and rejoicing of my heart. And if I'm going to stay a champion in the Word, i got to stay in the Word. So you don't have time to go to all the parties they got, all the dinners they want to give for you, all the things they want to do. Just can't do it. In your heart you might like to, but you can't do it and still stay a top professional. The Word has to be for those of us who teach, those of us who are responsible before God to share it with God's people. The Word has to be eaten. We have to be in that Word all the time, every day. Not just to read it for my own spiritual enlightenment, I have to read it in the light of being able to teach it to someone else that they too can walk in the light as the Word is the light. So I have to eat it. I have to digest it. I have to assimilate it. And then it becomes the strength of my life that I can give it out. 
the dark clouds that rest over us this day are due to the fact that the Word of God has been made of non-effect by the traditions of men. The traditions of men, for the most part, people, has so clouded men's minds that the love for truth is about as depraved as the love for holiness. And thus men are living in deserts of despair and defeat, and they are drinking from the stagnant pools of tradition instead of going to the fountainhead of all truth, God and His wonderful Son, Jesus Christ. In the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 15, Matthew 15, verse 1. Then came to Jesus scribes and what? Which were of Jerusalem, saying. Now this is the top religious brass, the scribes and the Pharisees, men who were heads of the worship in Jerusalem, men who were part of the Sanhedrin, the 70 that ruled Judaism. They said to Jesus, Why do thy disciples transgress the tradition of what? The elders. For they wash not what? Their hands when they eat bread. Isn't that terrible? Definitely was to the scribes and Pharisees. For they had set up certain laws. And one of them was what they were, suppose how they were supposed to wash their hands. And these scribes and Pharisees criticized Jesus and accused him of transgressing the tradition of the elders. He answered in verse 3, Why do ye also transgress the commandment of God by your what? Tradition. Of the two, which is the greater, the commandment or the tradition of men or the commandment or tradition of God. God's commandments, traditions of men, secondary. He says in verse 6, the latter part, Thus have you made the commandments of God of what? Non-effect by your what? Tradition will do it every time. Tradition will always make the commandments of God of non-effect. They will not be efficacious. They will not be utilized. Tradition will reign above the commandments of God. That's why he said in verse 7, you hypocrites, were they religious people? Definitely. They prayed at the right time, paid of their tithes, mints, and all, but they forgot the weightier matters of the law. Remember? Jesus said of them, you hypocrites, in other words, when we get caught up in tradition, we break the commandments of God and we are hypocrites. Isaiah talked real nice, he said, verse 8. This people draws nigh or draweth nigh unto me with their what? Ah, mouth. Honor me with their what? Lip. They talk about God. They talk about religion, they talk about love, they talk about service, they talk about all of those things, but in their hearts they are what? Far from me. And 
verse 9. In vain they do what? Worship me. Did they worship? Sure. But it was what kind of worship? In vain. Didn't do any good. It's like praying without believing. Just mouthing it. Just saying it. It's in vain. In vain they worship. I think some of us in the past have been at the same place. We were really religious. We wanted to really serve God, but you couldn't go. We couldn't go beyond what we were taught. Therefore, we went by what we were taught, and what we were taught was tradition. So we were worshiping God in how vain, worshiping Him in vain, teaching for doctrines the commandments of what teaching for right believing doctrine the commandments of men and the commandments of men are contrary to the word of God. You see in our time if the Bible's been studied at all it has been basically with a view of finding support for one or the other of the arguments, the beliefs, the tradition we are already hold. The true object of working and studying the Word, researching the Word, is to rediscover people what God has really written and revealed to us and for our learning. You see, the doctrines and traditions of men are eradicated and corrected only when the true doctrines of the Word of God are discovered. We no longer have the problem with the two crucified with Jesus because we know the Word says what? There were four. We no longer have Him dying on Good Friday and getting up Easter Sunday morning and trying to get three days and three nights out of that. Well, what has corrected, what has eradicated that previous false teaching? The Word. The Word. The birth of Jesus Christ. The, is September the 11th, 3 B.C. He was born sometime between sunset and moonset on September the 11th, 3 B.C. And sunset was at 618 that night as according to astronomy and moonset at 739. So in that 81 minute period on September the 11th, 3 B.C., Jesus Christ was born. The accuracy of the Word, working the Word, is what eradicates and corrects men's false teaching, wrong teaching, gets rid of tradition. We also know from astronomy, from history, and from the Word of God that the star his star that's mentioned in Matthew 2.2 2, is the star Jupiter. Bible scholars have argued about it for years like they have the birth of Christ. As far as we know and understand the Scriptures, there is no argument about it because the Word of God, history, and astronomy, and astronomy is a science Astrology is hooky poop stuff, but astronomy is a science. It's, it's documented science, typically. All three of those together. So that's how we get rid of tradition, how we eradicate error. It's the word, people. And you have to honestly come to the place where you constantly keep asking yourself, where did I learn what I believe? 
How did I get to the place of believing what I believe today? Who taught me this? For the most part, what men believe they have received from tradition and not directly from reading the Word of God. Many times the biblical truths will be a complete substitution for what you have believed because what you have believed will not stand the test of the Word, the truth of the Word, if you rightly divide it. Therefore, you must not only be content to give up tradition and wrong teaching, you must be thankful to give it up, happy, tickled to death, and receive instead of man's tradition, instead of man's imagination, the true divine revelation of his word. You see, in Matthew chapter 4, In verse 4, Jesus answered and said, It is what? Written. Man shall not live by what? But by every word. Every what? And the word every means what? That proceedeth out of the mouth of God. In the way ministry we allow the word to speak for itself fully knowing that the Word speaks more loudly, clearly, more effectively and effectually for itself than anyone could ever speak on its behalf. Man shall not live by bread alone, which means he has to have a little bread, but he needs something else. Most people spend most of their so-called Christian life gathering what they call bread. Money, material things, property, business stuff. Man shall not live by bread alone, but live by what? Every word, every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And of course, that's the figure of speech, condescensio. We not only need material things, but we need every word from the mouth. We need spiritual things, people. The world in tradition will always train us for the material. Only the Word of God will train us to rightly divide it and separate it out Knowing what Matthew 4 says, man shall not live by what, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. You see, the root of all biblical evils, which abound among us in such a tremendous way in our day and in our time, reside in the truth that the word of God and the words of God are not believed. They are not received and rightly divided. And thus they're not fed upon. They're not digested. They're not assimilated or acted upon. And the Bible is not read or enjoyed because the Bible's not understood when they read it. And you can't enjoy something that you read here if you don't understand it. <laughs> and because the Bible is not understood, it's not believed to be God's Word, but simply to contain at places within it God's Word. And thus the Bible is the most misunderstood and neglected and argued about and confusing book in the whole world. I read a number of scriptures to the 
whatever we just got through the advance healing arts advance I was thinking living arts might not be bad uh, couldn't think of healing arts read them a scripture about Noah where it says in God's word that when he died, he died at the age of 950 years. Now that's got to be a lie because he was not martyred. He didn't have Carter's little liver pills and M.O., whatever it is. He didn't have a $2 million scanner to look inside of people's guts or something. So it's got to be a lie. That's what it's been for traditionally and people who do not believe the word. My Bible says, and it's my only rule of faith and practice, that Noah lived to be 950. And with all of our modern abilities, we are really tremendous, you know. We've really got it. We're really the liver suppers, you know. Our culture is fantastic. By the time you're 50, you're supposed to have heart trouble. And not too many people make it beyond 65 or 70. That's why the government put it at 65. They knew they wouldn't have to pay much after that. Aren't we just wonderful? Is there any doctor that would like to tell me that he can keep me alive till 9.50? See, it's so far even beyond my thinking because we were all taught you have to die early to avoid the rush. <laughs> or something. I don't know. And the government advocates it so they don't have to pay you money out of the coffer that they're already bankrupt in. What a crazy world. By the time you're 65, and I've even had them come up to me and say something about being an old man. My God, 65. You know, I may be older, but I'm not an old man, I trust. But you see, everybody... Everybody thinks you have to die young, and we do, because believing, teaching, it's all we've ever heard. You know, when you live to be a hundred or some, my gosh, you've got to be freaky to live that long. I mean, it's the whole attitude. 950. No, I think uh, even uh, Moses, I think he was 120, wasn't he? He didn't even have to have these things, uh, the Bible says. He had wonderful eyesight. I'm not 120, and if I didn't have these on, I could read it, but with a lot of strain. I'll strain his drain, so I'll put them on. <laughs> Moses didn't need them. And Moses didn't have that highly trained optometrist I have. Why could Moses see without glasses for 120? And it says also that he was one heck of a man because all his physical abilities had not abated. Ha, 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 ha. That means, you women, he was still one, you know, wonderful man. <laughs> you know, you, you just got to get the impact of the word. You know, occasionally got to look at it. Ha, <laughs> ha. We are so advanced in our culture. We know all about all the sickness. Agri we know everything. Oh, people. We haven't caught up at all yet. Even got close to what Adam knew. Knowing some of the rest. But, you know, we talk. Well, anyway. I believe, as you do too, that the Word of God is the will of God. And that the subjects which are matters of controversy, 
and conflict among so-called Christian believers could be easily settled could Christians agree upon the principles of rightly dividing the word of truth. The word of God is all we can ever know about God or any subject relating to God and the things of God. The cry that I've heard through the years that the way ministry teaching is unsettling men's minds and contrary to the accepted teaching of Christianity through the years, and that the history of the church is certainly more true than our findings of the truth of the Word of God. As far as I'm concerned, those are all arguments that are asinine, they're invalid and inconsequential. The Word of God is true and rightly divided. The Word of God will hold its own against all comers. In the book of Nehemiah, in chapter 8, biblical research people can only do one thing, basically, the same thing that Ezra did of old. In 8 of Nehemiah, verse 5, Ezra opened the what? The book. He opened the book. Biblical research has to open the book. Ezra unrolled the scroll. He had to open the book. Biblical research has to open the book in the sight of all people so people can again see the book. And here it says, and when he opened it, all the people stood up. It's an Orientalism that whenever the Word of God was read, people stood Whenever a man talked about it, everybody sat down. They weren't too sure he was always right on, but they're always sure when the Word was read, it was right on. And so, for respect of the truth of God's Word, people would stand. That's why when they handed Jesus a scroll that day in Luke 4, I think, he read and said, This day is this script, and they all sat down. See? And he said, This day is this scripture fulfilled. Verse 6 says, And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen and Amen. Lifting up their hands, they bowed their heads, worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. And in verse 7, latter part, And the Levites caused the people to understand the law. They taught it. They taught it. And the people stood in their place. Verse 8, So they read in the book of the law, What? distinctly and gave the sense and caused them to understand the reading. They read in the book distinctly. They read it clearly. They read it with understanding. And then they explained it. They gave the sense of it. And thereby the people were able to what? Understand it. Biblical research works from the internal evidence of the Word to the external. We allow the Word to speak for itself, and we work it from the inside out. And to have a revelation from God, people, who is Spirit, to have a revelation from God in writing, it has to be in words, W-O-R-D-S. And as such, each word in the Word becomes very important, else you cannot have the true Word, the true revelation. You'll only end up with possession revelation from the adversary, and that's counterfeit from the spirit world. The Bible is written for believers, for men and women who want to believe and know God and His Word. It says so in the Gospel of John. Take a look at it. The Gospel of John, people. Wonderful record in here. John, 
20. You see, if the Bible is not what it claims to be, God's Word, then we have no true revelation. Here in John 20, in verse 31, it says, But these are what? Written. These are what? Written that you might do what? Believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And that believing you might have life through his what? Name. These things are written that you might do what? Believe. The revealed written word of God is for believers, for people who desire to believe. The Bible is not written for the unbeliever, the God-rejecter, the one who does not want to know truth, the one who does not want to really know God. It's written for men and women who want to know God, know the answers. That's why in 2 Timothy that we had earlier, it's the word of what? Truth. The Bible's the word of truth. In James, it says it's the engrafted word. The word engrafted is the implanted word. The Bible is the word of truth. It has to be implanted by studying it, by rightly dividing it. Titus tells us that it's the word of what? It's the word that's faithful. It's the faithful word. It's the faithful word. It's not only the word of truth. It is to be implanted. And the reason it is, because it's a faithful word. Faithful. What God has promised, he's not only able, but he is what? Willing to perform. And then that great record in Philippians says, it is the word of life. You and I will have life to the extent and in the proportion that the Word of God is rightly divided, taught to us, we believe it, we receive it, we assimilate it, we act on it. That's why this Word, people, to have the type of ministry that we have, it's not big, there are not millions and millions of people yet, but it is reaching down to where it will reach millions and those who hunger and thirst after righteousness will be what? And they'll be given an understanding. And those whom God has called before the foundation of the world, when the word of God is spoken to them, they will believe. These things are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have what? eternal life. That's our ministry. And I'm thankful to God that he's loved us enough to trust us with it and allow us to share it with our people. Father, thank you for your word tonight. Thank you for allowing me to share my heart from the word and the greatness of the word that lives in my heart with your people. Thank you, Father, that this is truth and that the truth never changes. In the name of Jesus Christ.